Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation and private equity, where we talk about the best way, the right way, the only way really to measure how leverage and growth capital drive private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run the Auxilia Mathematical website and I wrote the book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. This is video number nine in the value creation series where we continue to look at how leverage and growth capital drive private equity return. In the last video, we measured how the leverage effect, gearing and cash flow generation drove value in five different private equity deals. Here, we will take a closer look at that cash flow generation term and talk a bit about how these measurements should be interpreted. I need to bring this up because occasionally you will see a naive interpretation of the conventional value bridge where EBITDA growth is attributed to operational improvements, multiple expansion is attributed to the market, and what we call the cash flow generation term is often attributed to financial engineering or financing risk. The implication is that analysts often want to give the GP full credit for EBITDA growth as if that's some measurement of investment manager skill, less credit for the debt piece because higher debt corresponds to higher risk, and probably no credit for multiple expansion, which is often ascribed to luck. Now, there are several things wrong with this. The first is that there are company-specific and market-driven components within EBITDA growth and company-specific and market-driven components within multiple expansion. They're not difficult to calculate, and we'll show you how to do that in later videos. The second is that the change in net debt does not represent leverage or financing risk. It's a measurement of how much cash the company generated over the holding period after taking into account all of the company's debt and financing decisions. Positive numbers like this one here represent company cash flow that was used to pay down debt or simply accumulate on the company's balance sheet. That's equity that could have been distributed to shareholders during the hold, but it was not for one reason or another. Shareholders eventually get this capital when the business is sold, however. So positive value creation is simply a delayed equity distribution, and it's something for which the GP should get full credit. Negative cash flow generation means net debt goes up. That represents cash consumed or additional debt that was borrowed to sustain the company's enterprise valuation. Now, shareholders could have sustained that enterprise valuation by making additional follow-on equity investments during the hold, but since they chose not to, they get less capital when the business is eventually sold. Here, negative cash flow generation is effectively a follow-on equity investment that is netted from the exit proceeds, and of course, that's also something for which a GP should get either full credit or full blame. All right, what about those interest payments, the debt tax shield, and the financing risks, you ask? Well, the first two are easily built into cash flow generation. If the company didn't have to make interest payments on the debt, cash flow generation would have been higher. So you create a negative value driver for the after-tax interest cost, and then you can add it back to cash flow generation to create an unlevered cash flow generation measurement. Now, this is really just a cosmetic thing because they add up to the net debt change. And in my opinion, that's really a better way of looking at it. That's the number that's downstream from all the GP's decisions about debt levels and interest rates. Now, to get the financing risk, you need to look at the gearing term that we described in the last two videos. You can do this first by unlevering the EBITDA growth in multiple expansion by multiplying them by the average holding period equity ratio. This corrects the performance value driver and the valuation value driver for leverage, but it also leaves us with a hole in our value bridge. That hole is filled by calculating the deal's gearing, which is the product of the enterprise valuation change and the average holding period debt ratio. As we described in the last two videos, this measures how much extra equity was gained or lost because there was debt in the capital structure, the amplification of equity gains or losses. Or in a growth deal, it measures the drag on equity value change because there's excess cash on the company's balance sheet, the dampening of equity gains and losses. It's really what most people mean when they're talking about the impact of debt in an LBO. So the question is, how should we interpret it? Should the private equity GP get credit for it? Well, that's really up to you. I designed the value creation model so that the math is rigorous, the results are non-volatile, and you can split up the value drivers and piece them back together in whatever way makes the most sense for the GP's investment strategy or the LP's investment program. I'll just offer two considerations on the topic. The first is that when an LP makes a commitment to an LBO firm so they can do leverage buyouts, I think there's an implicit acceptance of the use of leverage, and the GP should get at least some credit for using leverage well. The other point is that leverage in this gearing term, it cuts both ways. Debt also amplifies losses. 
If you're going to discount a portion of a GP's gains because they were only due to financial engineering, you should also discount their losses that were only due to financial engineering. And I think that most analysts would be unwilling to make that concession. In my opinion, the most consistent and most symmetrical approach would be to give a GP full credit for gearing when things go well and full blame for gearing when things go badly. The good news is that these models allow you to measure it precisely and consistently, so at least there's no ambiguity about what the impact actually is. All right, with these philosophical musings behind us, we can now squeeze a couple more value drivers out of that cash flow generation term. Let's say that you want to separate how much of the return came from paying down debt versus accumulating cash. That's quite easy. At any time T, we can define net debt as total debt minus total cash or TD minus TC. When we run that through the model, we see that the negative delta ND term becomes minus delta TD plus delta TC. This allows us to measure cash flow generation as a combination of debt pay down and cash accumulation. Here's what it looks like in the value bridge chart. If total debt goes down and total cash goes up, then debt pay down and cash accumulation will be smaller components of a larger cash flow generation like we see here. It's not a terribly interesting breakdown in my opinion, but it's something that might be worth highlighting for a specific company or a specific investment situation. You can work the interest cost in the debt tax shield into the model in the same way. You start with a levered company and make a hypothetical assumption about what would have happened if there had been no debt. In the hypothetical scenario, interest costs could have either been distributed to shareholders during the holding period or accumulated on the company's balance sheet and distributed when the company is eventually sold. This makes interest cost a negative value driver. We'll start by assuming that we actually know the total amounts of interest paid. Here, the capital INT represents the total interest payments, and the large sigma term tells us that it's the cumulative sum of all the interest payments over the holding period. Now, we must also account for the fact that interest reduces a company's tax burden, so we create a positive value driver to represent the debt tax shield, which is equal to the product of the interest cost and the corporate tax rate. And then to make sure that everything balances, the hypothetical unlevered cash flow generation term must be the actual cash flow generation plus the interest payments minus the debt tax shield. We can simplify these formulas by combining the interest cost and the debt tax shield together into a single value driver, and you could do similar rearrangements with the unlevered cash flow generation term. And this gives us two value drivers that always add up to the traditional cash flow generation, which is simply minus the change in net debt. All right, that's fine as long as you know the cumulative interest payments, but LPs typically don't have access to this, and even deal teams might have a hard time figuring out the number. A reasonable shortcut would be to take the product of the weighted average cost of debt and the average total debt over the holding period as an estimate of the average annual interest cost and then multiply that by the holding period in years. This should get you fairly close and you can even swap out the average total debt number with an average net debt if that's what you have. Chances are that in a levered deal, there's not much capital just sitting on the company's balance sheet, at least not enough that would materially distort these numbers. Another thing you could do is try to plug in LIBOR plus 300 basis points for the interest rate. Quite often you'll find this substitution in the academic literature. It's used where researchers don't have access to the actual interest rates or actual capital structure data because they're typically dealing with hundreds or thousands of companies and their data sets and they're trying to deduce broader industry dynamics. Anyway, we're going to find that most of the time we're probably using some kind of rough estimate for interest. Fortunately, those estimates being wrong will not ruin the value bridge and make the value drivers add up to the wrong number. The unlevered cash flow generation, interest payments, and debt tax shield will always add up to regular value creation, even if the interest cost is wrong. Here's what the value bridge will look like. The after-tax interest cost will always be a negative value driver, and it will always give us a larger or less negative unlevered cash flow generation value. If you want to see how this works, as always, you can find an Excel template for this model on the website. All right, that's everything that I plan to cover, but I will add another section here to respond to a question about how one might measure the total impact of debt in an LBO, where you include the impact of interest and debt's mechanical amplification of equity gains and losses into a single value driver. We can go back to the last model where we broke cash flow generation into the after-tax interest cost and the unlevered cash flow generation. We will drop the traditional cash flow generation term since it's redundant and bring gearing down here. We can add these two together to create a new value driver called the total debt effect, which is equal to the product of the change enterprise valuation and average holding period debt ratio and minus the after-tax interest cost. Now, this gives us the following value bridge. As you may recall, EBITDA growth and multiple expansion always add up to a deal's unlevered return. 
And this is the product of the enterprise valuation change and the average holding period equity ratio. And then on the right, we can get rid of the redundant terms as follows. And this leaves us with three value drivers. The unlevered return on the left gives us the equity return without debt's amplification of gains and losses. Unlevered cash flow generation on the right tells us how much cash flow would have been generated if there wasn't debt. And now the total debt effect in the middle gives us the combined impact of debt's amplification and its interest payments. This is a pretty interesting simplification of the traditional value bridge. Here the value drivers are all measured in dollars or absolute value creation. We can divide everything on the chart by invested capital or tech V1 to get the times money value drivers that were introduced in VC103. Here all the value drivers add up to the deal's total equity multiple of invested capital minus one. Alternatively, we can divide absolute value creation measurements by the total equity value creation or delta tech V to get relative value creation. In this domain, all the value drivers always add up to 100%. Then we could take the deal's gross multiple of invested capital and raise it to the power of relative value creation to get the equity return multipliers as follows. In this domain, value drivers that are greater than 1.0x increase equity value and value drivers that are less than 1.0x decrease equity value. And when you multiply all the value drivers together, you get the total equity return multiple of invested capital. And then finally, you can raise the equity return multipliers to one over the effective holding period and subtract one to get the value creation IRRs. Please go back to the video VC106 if you want more information on how this math works. And of course, you can download the Excel model on the website that has all these calculations, all these conversions, and all the charts that we show here. All right, that's enough for now about how leverage and debt influence our private equity returns. I look forward to the next sections where we will start to talk about how broader market forces impact our value drivers so that we can come up with measurements that work a lot like public market equivalents or PME. But before we do that, we want to take one quick trip back to the company's income statement so we can see how P&L values like COGS and SG&A drive private equity value creation. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on Amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.